Good morning. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Last week in my sermon, I talked about Arnold. I can't remember if that was his first or last name. But I t did I tell you how old he was? I don't think I did. I was like, oh, Arnold, who uh, down in Fort Lauderdale, the city said you can no longer feed people. You can no longer feed hom homeless people. He got arrested doing it, and two days later, he was going to do it again. And he says, my faith demands that I do this. I didn't mention his age, 90 years old. When, at the time when he did that, 90 years old, he risked jail, he, he risked everything to feed people. Anson, do you remember the book we read in Sunday school about Greta Thunberg, about the young, young girl who started a worldwide movement? Do you remember how old she was? Was she younger than 90? probably since she was a, I think she was about a 10 or 11, maybe 12, 13, but in that age. Tells us that no matter who we are, no matter where we are, God can use us. God can speak through us. God can move through us. And hopefully sometimes we can get into that good trouble, as John Lewis used to say. Let us come into worship. Let us remember and give thanks for the saints in the Bible and for those today who say that loving our neighbor is so good. And I will do it no matter what. Let us come into worship so that we may be filled with that spirit, so that we may be filled with that love, so that we may see the world with eyes new. All who are able are invited to rise and let us join together in our opening hymn. Every time I feel the Spirit. Nancy. Oh, sure. <laughs> right, a little bit of a challenge. We want you to move on this. We, this is not going to be sung Minnesota North nice and stiff. We're going to move on this. Start <laughs> left. Bye. 
That was a good beginning. <laughs> Almost got it. All of us are like. <sighs> we'll get it. We'll get there. And just like we can be out of sync when we're singing a tune or out of sync with the beat of the song, so we can be out of sync with God's kingdom, with God's love, with God's will. And that's when we lament. That's when we say, oh, God, we were so close, or oh, God, we're so off beat. We need to get into harmony. We need to get together. We need to come. Let us join together in our unison in prayer of lament. God of justice, God of liberation, Jesus taught us with great power comes great responsibility. We read the stories of the Bible that often show us that power corrupts. The fate of our world is controlled by a relative few in power, and they are using it to enrich themselves. Too many are in need, and too little is done. Rouse yourself, mighty redeemer, and set the world right. Rouse yourself, loving shepherd. Protect those who are powerless and in need. Rouse us, fountain of living waters. And may your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Even when we are out of beat, God still listens to us. And just like a parent listening to a recital that's not quite there, does it with love and patience. Let us come into the words of comfort. You desire truth in the inward being, therefore teach us wisdom in our hearts. Let us hear joy and gladness. Create us in a new heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Restore us to the joy of your salvation and sustain in us a willing spirit. Open our lips, O Lord. A sacrifice of acceptable to God is a humble spirit and a humble and open heart. O God, you will not despise. I invite Barb to come up and light our peace candle. candle is lit. Closer to your lips. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me now? No. no. Like this. Yeah. Rock star. It is a custom in our congregation to light our peace candle during worship. Are you hearing me? Okay. It is a custom to use a microphone. <laughs> It is a custom in our congregation to light our peace candle during worship as a witness to the Prince of Peace and our communal intention to be peacemakers as a just peace church. Read to yourselves as I read out loud this piece by Sarah Teasdale called Peace. Peace flows into me as the tide to the pool by the shore. It is mine forevermore. It ebbs not back like the sea. I am the pool of blue that worship the vivid sky. My hopes were heaven high. They are all fulfilled in you. I am the pool of gold when sunset burns and dies. You are my deepening skies. Give me your stars to hold. May we pass the peace to one another and offer a star.
All who are able are invited to rise and let us join together in there is a wideness in God's mercy. Invite our singer, song leaders to come up. <clears throat> I think you'll be good if you just use this mic here. It's really hot, so. The first reading comes to us from the Gospel of John 6, 24 through 35. The Gospel of John was the last of the four Gospels written after Mark, Matthew, and Luke. The writer of this Gospel takes the slow approach with using seven miracle stories only. After last week's miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus talks to the crowd about bread and what truly fills us and what leaves us wanting more. Here begins the scripture. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I assure you that you are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate all the food you wanted. Don't work for the food that doesn't last, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the human one will give you. God the Father has confirmed him as his agent to give life. They asked, what must we do in order to accomplish what God requires? Jesus replied, this is what God requires that you believe in him whom God sent. They asked, what miraculous sign will you do that we can see and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna, manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus told them, I assure you, it wasn't Moses who gave the bread from heaven to you, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God, 
is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, Sir, give us this bread all the time. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Anyone know the number, how many books are in the Bible, in our Protestant Bible? 66, okay. Hey, Anson, very good. Someone pays attention during Sunday school. Yeah, there's me. Of the 66 books, 39 are in the Hebrew Testament. We have called it the Old Testament. We need to change that. It, God's word is eternal. Not in that this is the inerrant, infallible word of God, but God is eternal. And each, each generation writes and talks about God, and we say God is still speaking. And in this, we have First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles. Now, First and Second Samuel focused on the people, Samuel, David, and Solomon. And then First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles said, well, you got some of it right, but we're going to rewrite it. So we basically have six chapters that are six books that basically tell the same story. Because they saw it from different viewpoints, from different times, from different places. That's what the Bible is. It's 66 books of people trying to figure out who God is and what is happening. And how does that apply to the situation they live today? We're reading from 2 Samuel. This is King David. He's now, everything is now nice. He's now in Jerusalem. The uh, the Ark of the Covenant is there. There is times mostly of peace and prosperity. So reading from verse 11, chapter 11, verses 1 through 15. Or no, that isn't the one you guys are reading, are you? Is it? 26, I'm sorry. Flip the page. There we go. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made a lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David did had done dip, displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said, There are two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew with him and his children, and it used to eat at his, of his meager fare, and drink from his cup, and lie in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it, that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who had done this deserves to die. He will, shall restore the lamb fourfold because he, he did this thing, because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah 
and if that had been too little, I would have added much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and have t taken his wife to be your wife, and had killed them with the sword of the Amorites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to the neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the very sight of this son, for you did it secretly. But this thing I will do before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Blessed be the reading and the story of God and the gathering of God's people. You want to come up, Anson? Do you like comics? Who is your favorite superhero? Black Panther. Black Panther. What do you like most about the Black Panther? His colors? His colors? Okay. He has some pretty cool gadgets, though, doesn't he, with his suit? And he's really strong. And he's also a king. It's not bad to be king, is it? Yeah. But what's the difference between the Black Panther and, let's say, Loki? Because Loki probably has more magical powers, and he's, he's not even human, so he's probably stronger in some ways. You don't know Loki? Okay, uh, who does the Black Panther fight against? What is it? Uh, who's a supervillain? Do you remember, th uh, do you know about Thanos yet? Okay. No coaching. <laughs> well, what's the difference between a hero and a villain? Is it their powers? That one is stronger, so one is better? What's the difference between a hero, someone who does good and fights for what is right, and someone who does bad? Bad is not good. Because the bad guys often just fight for themselves, right? They're only s worried about their power and their what they have. They don't worry about other people. So being a superhero, it's cool to have powers, but you have to have the right heart. Otherwise, you quickly become the supervillain. Yep. That's what happened kind of today in the story of with King David. He did all these things great, and he did all these things right. And then he messed up really bad. And so God sent someone to talk to him and say, told him a story. And in that story, he was convicted. He was brought to realize that he did something really bad that he was able to repent and say, I, I did the wrong thing. He admitted it, so he became good again. So even though we try to do the good things and the right things, sometimes we mess up, right? Sometimes we do the wrong thing. But God gives us a chance to say, hey, I messed up, I sinned, I was wrong. I didn't help my neighbor, but now I can and I will. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all the things we have and all the things we can do and all the things we will learn. But help us to use it for good. Help us to use it for love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up.
Fight our choir up. Well, uh, our fearless leader, Anne, is going to visit her grandnephews and nieces and grandchildren and, and seeing her sisters, some of her sisters, which she hasn't seen for a long time down in the Twin Cities. So it fell upon me. So, <laughs> so that we got a great group here, um, and they, they did their best under my poor tutelage. <laughs> How many of you have watched The Lion King? Remember the scene where the, oh, it's not the lions, but what are the other? The hyenas. And they would say the king's name and everybody would shudder. They'd go, Ufasa. And everybody go, oh, Ufasa. Oh, well, 
we have people in our on our social media who do that. They go critical race theory, and people go, "Whoa, critical race theory! Oh, that's bad! That's bad! We got to get rid of that." It's become a boogeyman, just like lots of different things that are just plain every ordinary things, and. I'm sorry, but Fox News takes these things and makes them into the world's coming to an end, like critical race theory. Now, critical race theory is basically two things. Well, first of all, it's a theory. It's not the first thing, but it is a theory. It is an academic thing that has been started in 1989 and has been developed over the past 30 years. And it evolves, and it has changed as evidence comes to it. But it's based upon two things. One is that there is no biological reason we should divide people into races. We're all the human race. So that means, two, that our concept of race is socially constructed. And since it's socially constructed, since it's made up, it can be unmade. Now, those who are attacking this are saying, well, it was just a few bad apples. It was people who would say bad words to people who didn't look like them. And anybody can do that, so it really doesn't matter. But here is how we did this socially constructed critical race theory. Here's one example. After World War II, as we are coming out of the recession, the government thought it would be a great idea to send those young men and women who fought over in World War II to college. So they created the GI Bill that they could go to college and millions of young men went. Except for we had one million black one million African Americans soldiers, but they could not partake of this. There is a few, I think, out of the million that went, about a hundred got the GI Bill because they pushed hard. But I mean, it's 990,000, 90 didn't. And then after the GI Bill and after they graduated from college, you know, they were still pretty poor. So the government said, hey, that's create a way that they can have homes. So they created the Federal Housing Authority, I believe. And so they gave loans to these recent college graduates so that they can move to the suburbs. But guess who didn't get to partake in any of those loans? People of color. And then those mortgages that they signed for those houses in the suburbs had a clause in them, almost universal across the United States, that if you were to sell your house, you only could sell it to another white person. And if they sold it to another white person, that clause would stay in that, would go into the new mortgage, that you cannot sell this house to a person of color. And then, so people of color, those who had served our nation, were trapped in their houses, in their apartments, in those places, in those communities, and then they took a line and they drew a red line. Most of you should know this. They drew a red line around the communities that were majority minorities, and they said, okay, we're not gonna give loans for homes or not going to give loans for businesses or any invest any real government dollars to make that a better community like into parks and schools and roads that is critical race theory that it wasn't that those African Americans didn't try hard enough to go to college that they didn't study hard enough to go to college they just were excluded now, that does not mean that the white people who got those lo uh, student loans didn't study hard and that they worked hard to get their houses and they, and they had problems, but they at least got a foot in the door. 
as opposed to people of color. So since the 1980s, it's always been around, but with Ronald Reagan and John Wayne, we got this myth of individualism that it is all everybody pulled herself up by the bootstrap. And that Jeff Bezos today, well, you know, he, he, he packages every one of those uh, packages that are sent out and he's right there on the line with the rest of them working harder than everybody. That's why he's worth 200, 300, 400. Well, he got divorced, so, you know, <laughs> half of, but he's still worth a few hundred billion dollars. And if you work hard enough and if you're smart enough, that can happen to you too. Or not. So we have this myth of individualism that directly is opposed to God's kingdom. God's kingdom, God's love, that we are called to love our neighbor. We are called to clothe and feed our neighbors. We are called to care about what happens in our wider community, not just what happens to our own bank accounts, our own properties, our own people who think like us or look like us. So, as we said, okay, so we have, we're back in the Old Testament. I'm not supposed to say that anymore. I'll get, I'll, I'll figure that out some, get that off my tongue at some point in my life. Back into the story of the Israelites. And as I said, King David, he, he went in and he conquered Jerusalem and now it is his home and his palace is there and the government is there and the temple will be built with his son, but the Ark of the Covenant is there. So there's lots of prosperity, lots of blessing. Things are so good that King David, you know, he was a young scrapper when he was coming up through the ranks. And, and but now he's like, well, you guys got it. I'm going to stay home. You guys go out there and fight. Don't worry about it. You'll, you'll do it. God's with you. And because his armies were out fighting and everything was good, he had time to look around, you know smell the roses but he didn't look at the roses he was checking out oh she looks kind of pretty he spotted a woman and so he went and he had his servants go and bring the woman to his palace and that night after supper or after a few days he lay with her. And then he kicked her back to the curb and she went back to her house. But this thing happened that she got pregnant. So he decided, well, okay, here we go. I'll just uh, summon summon the, her husband home and said, hey, uh, yeah, give me a report. Okay, well, you know, you're home. Why don't you go home? Your wife is waiting for you. And Uriah, he was a man of honor. He says, how can I go and have the comforts of my home when all my soldiers are out in the field? So he just slept on the doorstep. So King David said, oh, let's try this another night. So he tried it at another night and the same was said, happened. So he said, okay, I'm sending you back to the front. Here's a note, please give it to another general. And in the note says, please put Uriah into the heaviest fighting and then withdraw and let him be killed. Problem solved. Now we know in that day and age, women were, they didn't even have an, a, a little bit of what women have today in terms of freedom. If you were a woman of higher rank, you know, with a higher family, you're kind of bartered around so that you would marry this guy's son and both of your families would prosper by the business arrangement. If you were a woman of a poor family or a family that struggled, you were sold to a family that could afford 
so that you could have some money so that she would raise, she would bear and raise the children for that family so that family would prosper. There were no rights. So, so you know, we often, I don't know, when we heard this story, oh, it was a love story. He saw her. She fell, he fell in love with her. He came in. They had a beautiful world. And then, then they had a son, and he rose up, and he became the next king. Isn't that beautiful? But as it said in there, well, David already had over 500 wives and concubines, probably a 1,000. Well, I have 500. I'm kind of bored with them, so, you know, what's one more? You know, whether or not Bathsheba had any feelings for him back was of no consequence to King David, was no of consequence to the laws of that time, the social mores, the norms, the culture. She was Uriah the Hittite's property. Now she's King David's. And Uriah the Hittite, the Hittite. So when, so when Joshua was going in and conquering the, the land of the promised land, they'd get rid of those Jebusites and those Moabites and those Hittites and those Parasites. And they would get rid of all of them because they were beneath us. Well, they didn't. Though they tried a few times in the Bible, they said they tried to clear them all out. They didn't, so they lived, but all of them served the Israelites in servitude, in desert servitude, slavery, if we want to call it what it is. So even though Uriah the Hittite worked his way up through the army of the ranks and became a general, When it came time to get rid of them, King David sent a note. The people looked at it and it said, yep, okay, let's get rid of him. He's just a Hittite. What do we care if he dies or not? He's not one of us. We have no loyalty to him. We have no compassion, no ethics that say that to ask why is this happening? There was nothing in their laws, there was nothing in their religion at the time to really go against this except for Nathan the prophet who comes and talks to King David about a rich man and a poor man, a man with whole flocks of sheep and a man with a single little lamb that has it stolen from him. Now, at the end, David says, oh, I confess it was me. And then the next line is, is he went to jail. Nope, it wasn't. I mean, he got punished that he had to stay in his palace for the rest of his life. He wasn't allowed to go out with his armies anymore, which what he did got him into trouble in the first place. He didn't lose his lands. He didn't lose his money. He didn't lose any other of his wives. He... He didn't even lose Bathsheba. But he was sorry in his heart. Now in 1 Kings, when it tells about King David, it doesn't tell about Bathsheba. It edits it out. It says, nah, we don't need... To. Well, king David was, a, was the best king we've ever had. We don't want to tell bad things about him. So we're just going to edit that story out. We're just going to ignore it. We're just going to throw it away. And they did. First Chronicles said, hey, that sounds good. Let's not mention this because we're saying, hey, King David, he followed God and he was loved by God and God loved him and everything was perfect under King David. So we will forget about that. When the early Europeans came to America, we looked at the Bible for inspiration. Well, guess what? America is the new promised land. And just as the Israelites went in and moved out the rest of the people living there so that they could live, it's a God-given story, so we can do it's our God-given right. 
So we came in and we displaced, stole, murdered from the indigenous First Nations. And then we decided we were not quite ready to do all the work that necessary to be done, and so we started bringing in slaves. Well, Israel, King David had slaves. King David had, so we can have slaves as well. Critical race theory says this is important. Now, it doesn't say, and it's not meant to say that everybody back then was a lying, cheating, scoundrel, murdering, thieving, da 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 da. That are all of our founders were men of ill repute. But just as King David did some good things and did some really bad things, so did people of the early settlers and people in our early government and people today. It's not black and white that either everybody's all good and everything they do is good or people are all bad and they'll never get ahead. So we are all children of God. And so, yes, should we celebrate the 4th of July? Yeah. Should we celebrate June 19th? Yes. Should we pledge allegiance? Yes. Should we demand that our people of color be treated better? By the police? Of course. Should we lift up all men are created equal? Yes. And we should work to make sure that every citizen, no matter where they live, gets the right to vote. They're using that critical race theory and other things as Mufasa. Watch out, otherwise it's going to get you. So we have to put in all of these new laws for voting because otherwise Mufasa might take over. Mufasa might come. Whether it be socialism or communism or... It's interesting how we are not scared of Muslims as much as we used to be 10 years ago. But this is the current thing to make us afraid, to make us separate ourselves by the socially constructed ways that there are white good people who are proud Americans and then there's the rest who are good enough for the minimum wage and to serve us, but they need to be controlled and watched over. So, one thing we can do is, in the Senate, that Voting Rights Act for the People has been stalled, is just sitting there while states around the nation are in restricting voting, are putting in, are coming up with the blamest reasons. And stupidest laws that we can no longer feed people if they are in line we can no longer give them water if they've been standing in line for eight hours so we're supposedly living a democracy do we have the power to do what is right do we have the will? God, I sure hope so. I sure hope so. Amen.
So we come into a time of prayer. Are there joys to be shared with Karen? On my way to church this morning, I uh, met Paul and Ann home at the library book return box, and uh, she asked me to um, thank everyone for our prayers. Karen ran into Paulette to wanted to give her thanks for our prayers. Steve. Prayers for good, good surgeons. Thanksgiving. Steve Nielsen is home. John got a good report from his doctor as well from Duluth. Vicki gives thanks for God who heals our bodies. Dan. And gives us well, Kylene and I well wishes for our upcoming vacation this week. Any others? On our prayer list is Meredith and Vicki and Paul, Rana, um, Francie, Paulette, Larry, Steve. Family of Dick Boot Height, Lisa Ann's family. Um, uh, got a message from Jenny. She's on call this week, so she's probably at the hospital right now. But her her friend Otis, who we have been lifting up a little bit, uh, passed away. So let's keep that family and Jenny in prayers and lift up our shut ins, Eleanor, Nona, Lou. Bev and Body, Bobby. Any other concerns to be brought up? Rain. Rain. Should, that should just make up a whole page there. Rain. <laughs> Prayer needs. Any others? Let us come into prayer. Almighty and amazing God, the writer of Ecclesiastes said, what has done before will be done again. What has happened, happens now and will happen again. That there is nothing new under the sun. Help us to prove that wrong. 
help us to prove that there is a time in our present and in our future where the rich and powerful will no longer be so emboldened and crass to take land, property, and people from one another. That there will be a time when all will be valued and your earth itself will be valued. There will be a time when we're all brought before you, brothers and sisters all, caring for each other, feeding each other, loving each other, helping each other. And until that time, let us listen to the prophets of yesterday and today that call us to that world. and help us to act. We lift up those upon our prayer list, those in our hearts and minds. And we lift up your planet that we may truly repent, that we may turn to heal the lands, the waters, all life, So that rain may fall. So that habitats and forests and plains may thrive. That there be enough for all. Hear us as we pray the prayer as taught by your Son. Our Father, Mother God, you are in heaven. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In our time of giving, it is time to practice. Okay. Wine says, pray for our church leaders 10 minutes a day this week. Kind of already do that, but always helps to be remembered. So in these, these are blue. These are little heart work, as Barb would call them, little spiritual practices that you are not going to be graded on, but may inspire you to find new ways to lift up God to be connected, to love our neighbors. And so as we give of our time and our energy, and we use these to strengthen our hearts and our minds and our discipleship, our faith. Why would you pass these around? Now the orange ones are for our young people. And if you believe that you're young at heart, but one of them says, gives up your video games for a day. So if you play video games, you can, you can grab one of those that may get one. And I just lost the other piece of paper that I, ah, oh, Bob got it. That's what you were running after. On the back there and in your newsletters again, it's a prayer of the month. You know, it doesn't have to be done every day, but you can use it in your daily devotions are lifted up, and it's a prayer that we all can pray together, and we can pray for our ministries and events. We can use it to keep track of who we are praying for. We can remember to give thanks what we are, how God is good all the time. And then listen, where is God leading us? Where have we experienced God? talked about at the board, the director's retreat about how we can grow our church because of course we have to grow our church but if we do it the right way 
not by bringing in consultants, not by advertising, not by getting all these programs. We hope people do it, but if we do it the right way, it starts with our hearts. As our hearts grow, then the church will grow. When people see something different in us, they're going to want to be a part of it. When some people see us doing what we profess we should do, they'll want to say, hey, I want to do that too. I want to be a part of that. So I'll use these as ways to help our church grow by growing by ourselves, growing in our groups, growing as a church together. For news at God at work in our church and community, our fearless leader is not here. We have not appointed an official vice moderator, so, so I'll just give the brief recap. Um, we have on Wednesday nights, we have the sing-along, which we are doing, and you don't even have to sing. You can just come and sit and listen. That's from 7 to 9. Or 7 to dark. It is getting a little... At, at the end, it's really getting hard to see the words. Um, we are doing Tai Chi, even though Thursday I'm officially off. We uh, Kylene's working that morning, so I will be here. We will, we will do Tai Chi. And then I need someone to volunteer to take my place down at the Harbor Watch at 8 o'clock. It's usually just me and the birds, but, you know, they might get a little nervous if I'm not there. So if someone wants to go down there and reassure them I'll be back the next week, that would be great. And then next week, uh, uh, Carol Mork uh, will be preaching and leading the service for you. And, and it's just a short vacation for us, so we'll, we will be back. Any other announcements? Yes, Bob. There's a graveside service tomorrow afternoon at 2 for Ray Schoberg. Yes, uh, one of the ways you can help contribute is through your is your pledges and donations and offerings, and there's a basket back there to be given, and we do have online resources as well. And if you're not sure exactly how to do this, Kevin is more than willing to talk to you and guide you through it. Nancy. Yes, we have app we have cookies and apples in the back for our coffee hour. Oh, uh, I was wondering if I was I, I have this out and actually I'm going to be starting to wear this again. And even though at our board retreat we have been talking about trying to go back in sometime in September, what I've read over the past couple of days is a little scary with this Delta variant. So. Please, when you are going out in the community, if you go into stores and stuff, please start wearing them again for your sake and for the community's sake. And, you know, if we do get back inside, we probably aren't going to, we definitely aren't going to be singing right away inside. And we're going to be asking that everybody masks. And though we are opening up the building in small ways, if you do have a meeting inside, it'd probably be best if, even though it's not our policy, but that's 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 going above and beyond the written letter and start masking again. Hopefully, this thing will pass quickly, but that's what we keep saying. It's god awful, but it's the. Way. But the only way we do this is by taking care of each other and wearing the mask, getting vaccinated, and doing all the stuff we should be doing to help keep numbers down. Amen. 
All who are able and ready to rise and let us join together in a closing hymn. Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. All right, our song leaders. All God's critters. And now may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. May God lift up God's face to you this day, to our planet. Bless us and grant us peace. Amen. 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 Go with God. Amen.